Hello, everyone. Uh, let's, uh, we'll give a second for people to roll in. Uh, I just came from another lesson that I was teaching virtually, so I apologize for that in advance. Um, I'll quickly pull up our slideshows here, and I'll start my screen share. Um, file. All right, um, I am presenting now, and I'm going to start my screen share. Hold up. All right, can everyone see the PowerPoint presentation? Yeah. All right, so welcome everyone to lesson five. Uh, we're going to be covering methods, parameterization, um, and intro to objects. It says abstraction here, but you'll see later in the agenda that that's something that we'll cover in the next lesson, just because it's a little bit more difficult of a concept. So as you can see, we're still on track with our schedule here. Um, in fact, we're, we were slightly ahead because you guys were able to cover uh, program flow uh, last Thursday. So today we'll be doing, just as I said before, intro to methods, uh, parameterization, and intro to objects. And then our next lesson for this week will introduce you to more um, object oriented programming concepts such as encapsulation abstraction. Uh, we're not going to be getting into inheritance or polymorphism. If you guys are you know, into that sort of, uh, I wouldn't say advanced Java, but that's like more later Java learning that you wouldn't need to know for basic learning levels. Um, but yes, we'll go in depth with objects and classes then and teach those concepts for the latter, the latter portion of this week. Uh, as you can see, the timings have changed for this week, so it'll be 5.30 to 6.30 on both Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, so the first thing that we're going to do today is we're going to give you the solution or walk you through the solution to, in, in a sense for the prime number calculator that we left off with in the last lesson. Um, then we're going to give you a really nice lecture about methods and a few demonstrations of like the benefits of them. So specifically, this is an intro, and then we'll show you how to know which parameters you're supposed to use for your methods. Then we'll specify the difference between methods that return values and methods that are voids. And then we'll describe a concept called, or show you a concept called method overloading. After methods, we'll get into objects. We'll show you how objects are really just your own variable type and how they can store local variables as well as other objects. Okay. So as I, as I said before, we're going to start off with uh, the solution of the prime number calculator. Okay, These are all the prime numbers from 1 through 100. Um, so prime numbers, uh, the, just to make sure that we're all clear on what the objective was, is it's supposed to be able to take in one number, uh, like any sort of number within a realistic, like feasible value, and be able to determine whether that number is prime or not. Meaning, does that, uh, does that number have factors other than one and itself. Um, and if so, then it's uh, it's not prime. But if it only has the factors one and itself, then it is prime. Um, one and zero are objectively not prime numbers. Uh, I don't know if that was ever expressed in your uh, math class. So for the purpose of this study, we um, we use that as a precondition to a uh, precondition meaning like we're not going to really worry about people inputting um, zero or one into the program. So here, I'm going to just go ahead and start typing out the solution. So we're basically going to specify the input number by creating an integer, calling it number. This is the number that we're testing to determine whether it's prime or not. And we're going to set it equal to, well, let's say a really simple number for now, which we know is prime, the number seven. So, um, and this is just once again a test case. So now over here in the comments, I'm just going to say this is a precondition. Um, I think that's probably right. A precondition is that um, our number 
is not going to be z zero or one. Okay. Um, so the boolean that we can start off with because of that idea is we can take a boolean called is prime and set it equal to true. So because we learned about booleans last week, you should be able to understand the simple statement. Once again, I'm using camel case to name this. Um, you can name this whatever you want. You can even call it prime with the lowercase p. It doesn't matter, but just know that this is the num this is the boolean that will store your output. The reason we're defaulting it to true is essentially going along the principle like we're going to be indexing through multiple numbers leading up all the way to the number seven, seeing if seven is divisible by that number. And we're essentially trying to prove seven wrong as not prime. So like we're going to start it off as true we're gonna, like you do in court, right? Like you start off with the person as innocent and you try to go through a series of trials to prove them as guilty, right? So similarly, we're going to go through several numbers to try to see once we trip across one of them, just one of them other than one and seven itself that are divisible, uh, that seven is divisible by, then we know that the number is not prime. So the way that we do this is with a for loop so that we can increment across every integer. Right? That's the simplest way to do it. You obviously can use while loops, but you'll realize that the reason for loops are there is to really provide you with the condensed and simpler form of a, uh, of a while loop. So we initialize our value with uh, i equal to two. This is just the index variable we'll be using to test all the numbers. We'll say i is less than number, so we'll test all of the numbers leading up to the number before number. So I know that sounds confusing because the name of the variable itself is number, but basically what this is going to do, because we do not want to have to deal with zero and one in our divisions or modulus, we're basically going to be testing two, three, four, five, and six. We're not going to test seven because seven, we know that even in prime numbers, seven will be divisible by seven. So um, just to review the format of this for loop, right? For here, first is your initialization statement of the index, then here is your uh, condition uh, by which it is determined if what is between these curly brackets will run. And then here's your incrementation, which will happen at the end of whatever's in these curly brackets. OK, so now we have a basic for loop going that will be able to just create this uh, or set the value of i to all the numbers two through seven doing all those iterations. So now um, the logic of this is that we'll have an if statement um, that basically takes is prime and sets it equal to false. If seven, if the number is divisible by I. So how do we do that? If number modulus I, so this gets the remainder of number divided by I and essentially if something's divisible by another number, then the modulus of that should be equal to zero. So that's why we can use our equals comparison here. So we're saying the value of our remainder of this division statement, if that is equal to zero, then we know that it is divisible. If it's divisible, then we can immediately reject it right there that the number is not prime. So because the number is not prime, we take ibs prime and we're able to set it to false. Okay. So now you'll see over here um, that the outcome of this, or to actually see the outcome of this, you need to print it, obviously. Um, print line, and we'll say prime uh, for the simplicity of this, um, and so that I don't have to do another if statement. I'm just going to do it like this. So I'll just say prime, and then is prime. So I'm not sure if we showed you this in a previous lesson uh, when we taught you guys booleans, but yes, you can actually encase the values in a print statement just like you can with the numbers by just doing a, print, uh, a plus symbol after whatever uh, text you want to print out. So basically this will do prime colon space and then whatever, whether it's prime or not, it will either say true or false. If you guys want to create like a nice intuitive program, then a better way to do it would have been to like create an if statement. And if is prime is true, then say, Yes, this number is prime, but uh, oh, oh and, and then the else would be this number is not prime. Um, so yeah, what I could also do here is say that number, I could add number here so it actually displays the number that I'm testing, but I'm not going to worry about that either. So let's just go ahead and test this first. Uh, we should get the output that um, number is, yeah, that our prime is true. And then you'll see that the second we test the, I think it's called composite number six, for example, you'll see that we get false. 
So I guess just to give an example, why is it returning false? So we we start off with this prime is true. We start off with this i index equal to two. Then we keep incrementing. It's not going to run this if statement uh, until it gets to or actually yeah sorry sorry. It, in the very first iteration of this, it will see that hey six is divisible by two. Why? Because six divided by two is remainder zero and zero is equal to zero. So then it immediately says is prime equals false. OK, now what I want to express here is like efficiency of your program, right? Because once you see that is prime is false, do we really want a program to continue going? Hey, can six be divided by three? Hey, can six be divided by four? Can it be, be divided by five? Can it be divided by? Yeah, can it be divided by five? And then it would stop there, right? It doesn't need to test those anymore because it already knows that it's not prime since it already tested value that it's divisible by. So the thing that we can show you here uh, for the first time is what's called a break statement. The reason that I'm putting it in in this example is because it's quite simple. All it does is at this exact point of the code, it just terminates this for loop. So you're no longer having to check. Um, you no longer have to check the rest of the numbers and you'll see that uh, it no longer. Uh, it actually runs the program just barely quickly, uh, uh, barely quicker. Um, a way that you can also prove this is by printing out. Um, uh, print line uh, and I'll say like value in test, right? And then I'll add um, num uh, sorry, not um, number, but this. OK, so this will tell us what so value value test test to see if it's divisible by. So uh, you'll see that it, it just tests two and nothing else. See value in test is two. However, if I got rid of this break statement, then it would still continue testing everything unnecessarily. which is quite inefficient. OK, another very easy way to do this is because you know that um, this is your condition over here. Instead of creating a break statement, what you could do is add an and um, like an and like this and then say is prime because um, if you know that your number is already not prime, then you don't need to test anymore, right? So basically it's just adding it to the condition. However, if it's still proven as prime, then we still need to seek for opportunities to prove it as not prime. So you'll see that this as well is uh, is effective in making the program more efficient. So you see it only tests two. And then the last thing I wanted to show you is uh, because this is prime example is supposed to show you the uh, real power of computer computer like uh, yeah, the real power of computation and uh, through programming, you should really the most efficient methods that you've seen are actually using um, a method that we haven't learned before, but don't worry, it's very easy to follow. But it's math.sqrt and then uh, number. And then what we want to do here is actually create less than or equal to, because let's say I was testing the number uh, 64. The last number that I really need to test, if you if you're familiar with math principles, the last one that I really need to test as I'm going up is the number eight, because uh, after after the number eight, we are we already know that we don't need to test more values um, because then the, the, it will just be the complement of whatever previous factors there were. Once again, I'm not trying to get into math principles here, but if you guys were wondering how you could the most like the most optimal version of this program, at least for our purposes that we can do. It's by doing this. So this will just take the square root of number and stop after it passes that. As you can see, this one will run tests all the way, uh, all the way till eight and stop. Um, however, we can test a better uh, example by saying something like 67. Which is uh, which is actually prime. So the reason I was giving this example is 67 is actually a prime number. So uh, because of this case, uh, because of this case, instead of going on for uh, forever, which it would have, even if we had this break statement here, like like I showed you before, even if we had this break system, uh, this break statement, uh, this would have gone on uh, forever. See, if it was just like this less than number, it still would have gone all the way till 67 because there is no number down the line that to prove that it's not prime. However, in realistic math concepts, you know that once you've tested all the way to the square root of that number, you no longer need to test any longer.
So as you can see, this is the ideal case. And then with the same example from 64, you'll see that with our break statement and the square root, it's the most efficient because now it only tests. It only tests the value too. All right, any questions on the prime number calculator? Uh, any people raising their hands in chat, Sai? No. Nope. All right, then we can move on. So the next thing we're going to get into is, I believe, our intro to methods. So I'm going to stop sharing, and Sai, you may go ahead and take the wheel. Okay. So here we go. Here's lesson slides. You don't have permission to access this file. Pull up the presentation again. Wait, do you mean screen share? Like, yeah, your your present the presentation, the PowerPoint. Okay, hold on, sorry. Share. All right, do you see it? Yeah. Okay, so we're now we're getting into some more advanced concepts, if you will. So one of our first concepts is methods. So methods are basically a way to reuse code. So, eat, so instead of calling, you basically get to set aside a group of statements that you want that you can ca then call from anywhere in your code. So if you've ever been into like FTC or sorry FLL, and you used my blocks. My blocks are basically methods, right? So you have one group of functions, or in the my blocks case, blocks that you can run at any point. And what you can do to make those functions, or I mean those statements, even more useful is you can pass in parameters, and those parameters will let you modify the behavior of the method. So the method is basically a way to reuse code, and it helps make your code really short. So. I start sharing. OK, I'll, I'll stop sharing. I think I've already started. OK, cool. Oh, yeah, just to quickly uh, add to the analogy that you very well described for like FLL students, if you're an FTC student who already had like one year and probably used like um, used like FTC blocks, you might be familiar with uh, what's called functions. And like, you know, when you used to be able to drag those blocks out and create something called like do something and then you can actually add parameters or inputs. That's essentially the same thing as methods in this scenario, just so that you guys who have used blocks in the past in FTC, they're also familiar with it. So it's relatable to both FLL and FTC. OK, so let's we're going to take a scenario this time. So our scenario is. We want to calculate the area, so in the traditional way. I might have, so let's say all my rooms are square, just to, just as an assumption. Or let, okay, better, better scenario, all rooms are round. Right, so if I have int room one radius, okay, I, I can say that's five, int room two radius, might be 10 int room three radius might be 100. And so for each of these radiuses, I have to go through the calculation. So I can say int room one area is equal to room one radius times room one radius times 3.14, so that's pi r squared. And then you basically have to go through and do the same thing. So you're going to hit Control C and Control V, or, or, and you're probably going to change this to room two area is equal to room two radius times room two radius, and, and you keep going. So then I'd have to add another set of print statements, system t to print. And I'd say room one radius 
is equal to, and I'd say, sorry, room one area. Room one area. And then I'd have to copy paste the same thing and do room two area. So you see how it gets repetitive. So now if we start using methods, we can, we can take this bit of code that says calculate the area and print it and separate that out. So the way all, for now, all your methods are going to start with public static void. And we'll get we'll get to why you have to put public static void. But for now, just remember that every method starts with public static void. And then your name of the method. So your name of the method is going to follow the same camel case as the same camel case as variables. So we're going to say room area. And I'm going to pass an integer int radius. So. And then here I can put in my statements. So I'm going to say. Sys int area is equal to radius times radius times 3.14. So this is giving me my area, which is pi r squared. Then I'm going to print that out and saying system out that print ln. The room area is an area. So I've just taken it. I've just taken these two lines of code and I put it into a method. So what I can do now is I can call the radius, the area method from back from in my main method. So I can say room area and I now can just pass any integer so I can pass room two radius room area room three radius so you see how so all of this which was each statement took three lines is now or, oh I have to do capital A Now if I run this, you see how three lines that you have to keep copy pasting to repeat. Yep. Three lines that I have to keep copy pasting is now condensed to act. Uh, OK, so I'm just going to. You have an eight there. Oh, OK, wait. Yeah, never mind. That's. Double, double, and. All right, let's try this again. OK, so this many lines over here is now down to just these lines. Like. So like nine lines, if you wrote it out, is now condensed to six lines of code. So that's that's just to show you the power of a method, which lets you reuse code and shortens the amount of code. So if you notice public static void, and you're wondering, where have I seen that before? Well, let's actually write up here. So all your code up till now has actually been in something called the main method. So in Java, all code is written inside of methods. So methods, so you always need to have this main method, which is what the program is going to call first. So that's, so you, everything you've written till now has actually technically been inside a method, and now we, we're learning to create our own methods. So Josh, can you pull up the presentation again? Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Can you see it? Yeah. And then can you go? Couldn't go to the next slide.
Yeah, so basically the entire idea with a method is to make it as reusable as possible. Wait, let's see. So, so you want to be able to use it in as many situations as possible. So what you want to do is you want to specify parameters that can modify the behavior of the method. So in that first example, our parameter was an integer that we called radius. So we could pass the radius and have the method calculate area. So parameters can be any data type. It can be an integer, a string, and then later down the road objects. And basically, yeah, the idea is to choose methods that are relevant to what you want to do. So you can make the usefulness of the function of the method as broad as possible, right? So instead of, so if you go back to the, let me go back to the code. So now let's say I'm, okay, sticking to the example of area, I want to say I'm a tiling company I want to calculate number of tiles necessary. So let's say for now that I have. So right now I'm just going to assume that I have a one square foot tile. Right, and then we're always going to have square rooms. So if we have one square foot tiles and we have square rooms, it would be really easy to say, make a method where it's like public void, public static void, count tiles. And then here I'm going to say int width, sorry, this is rectangular rooms. int width and int height length. So it, since we only have one square foot tiles, it would be really easy for me to say, let me just multiply the width times the height. Width times length. And then I just print out that's how many tiles you need. So system. And we can say you need so since we have one square foot tiles and we're, we have rectangular rooms we can just multiply the area and then say you need x tiles right so if i in this scenario that would work fine so i can say count tiles And we can say my width is 10 and my length is 50. And I would get out 500 tiles. However, if say uh, a week later I get two square foot tiles. Right now I have to rewrite count tiles. Instead of that, if I chose my parameters correctly, I would add a parameter called int tile area. Tile size. Right, so now I can say tile size is one. And here I would say double tiles is equal to area divided by tile size. And then here I would say tiles. And this should technically be lowercase because camel case. Um, here. Right, so now I can just say count tiles one 
And then if someone wants two square foot tiles, I can go to, what is that? Count tiles and then 10, 50, and two, right? So now I can keep reuse this as, in as many situations as possible because I can pass in the tile size. So this isn't really something that you guys should, you guys will really need to think about. It is something, it's just something that to keep in mind is you want your methods to be as widely usable as possible. So, so in order to do that, you want to provide as many specific parameters that can vary the behavior of the method. So I guess I forgot to explain this, but you can pass as many parameters as you want. So the way you do that is you say, is you put a comma between the parameters. So I can have two parameters, I can have one parameter, I can have a thousand parameters. All I need to do is say comma. What is going on? Okay, all I just do is say comma int new parameter, right? So I can keep on adding as many parameters as I want. All I need to do is put a comma between every parameter. So when you're specifying a parameter, if you haven't figured out already, what you do is you specify the name, the type of the parameter. So this can be integer, boolean, string, char, anything that we've learned till now, and the name of the parameter. So what it does is it creates a local variable. So this variable radius is only available within within these squiggly brackets. So it's only available within the method. So radius is created within the method, and then once the method's over, radius is peers. So what? So I guess the format for a method right now is going to be public static void, and we'll get to why public static void in the next lesson. The name of the method, which we're going to do in camel case, then parentheses, and then inside the parentheses, you can have, you set the parameters, and you can have methods with no parameters, you can have methods with a thousand parameters, it doesn't matter. You can have as many number of parameters as you want, you just need to specify the type and the name, and then you put squiggly brackets, and then all your statements go inside the squiggly brackets. So are there any questions on the basics of methods so far? All right, uh, there are none. So do you want me to go back to the presentation now? Yeah. OK. Hold on. Go ahead and present again. All right, next slide. And from now, Vasu will help, will take over. Oh, okay. So as you guys have already learned, methods are used to execute repetitive bits of code. And so as you guys were, uh, so when you were, um, uh, when Sai was teaching you guys your code for um, actually uh, for the displaying of, um, for uh, displaying your code inside of a method, that was a void method. So um, uh, you could see that on the left hand diagram. But what if you want your method to actually do a calculation? It's best to return a value. So do you remember like back in second grade where they used to teach you for addition, for addition, they had this inbox where they, you basically drew a box. There would be one side where you went in and inside of there, there would be some sort of function that went on. And then after that function was done, there was an out box. And that's how, um, that's how calculations were actually done. And that's how they taught, that's how they taught you in like second grade. That's basically what we do in methods. When it comes to the input for um, a returning value, if you have a method that returns a value, what it does is you put in your input, which is your parameter, it runs the code inside the method, and the output to the return, and then it returns its output. 
And so, um, but it's best to use void if you want to display text or if you know that you're only going to use it to display text or stuff like that. And um, let's go to repel and I can show you guys a little bit more about what, um, about what this is. All right, I stopped sharing. You can go ahead right. and share the repel. All right. Can you guys see? Yep, it's coming up. Yeah. All right. So, um, Sai so already created this. Um, the, um the count tiles uh, method so we can be well we're not going to use the count tiles how about we use the um, uh, how about we use the room area one for now okay so what we can do is um let, let's comment out let's just copy the room area and then we can just comment that out or actually we don't need to so let me click there we go. So what we can do is we can get rid of the system down.println. And so basically what this method's doing is it's taking the value, it's taking its input, and it's getting this area, its radius, and it's running the calculations. But then how do we actually return the value? How do we actually send it back to whoever called it? How do we actually send it back to here? Hey, this is the value of the room area. Well, we have to do a return statement. So all you need to do is you just need to type in return, and then you want to type in the value that you actually want to return. In this case, we want to return area. So what we can do is we can just do return area, and then put a semicolon. And you'll find that there's actually an error here. The reason is because we already had a void, and if you and if you uh, remember back to that diagram that um, I showed you guys on the left hand side about a void. There is no output area. There's no way for it to actually get outputted. So what we have to do is we actually have to replace this void. And what do we replace it with? If you look over here, the uh, the data type that we are actually returning is a double, right? So we have to re so we have to replace void with double. And uh, what this is going to do is it's going to say. Uh, it's going to look through all these keywords. It's going to see double. And so it's going to say, think, OK, I'm going to return the double. And then when it goes over here, it returns an actual double value. And so if we go back to here, uh, if we run it, it's not going to display anything. What we can do is we can actually, um, we can create, um, we can, not even we don't even need to create another variable. What we can do is we can do system dot out dot print ln. I think I spelled that. And then we can put this on the other side. And then what it's going to do is it's going to print the actual value that what the output is of that method. So what? So basically, what's going to do is it's going to see the room to radius. So it's going to say room area. It's going to go look at room area. It's going to say, okay, I'm going to have to return a double. It's going to put it, plug in room to radius for the actual parameter. It's going to run the calculations for area, and then it's actually going to give back the value of the area. And it's going to send it all the way back up to here. And so that's how it's actually going to work. And if we run it, you can see. I'll display room two radius right there. So yeah, that's basically when it comes to returning things. So um, yeah, with the void one, so I already showed you, there's no actually, there's not actually a way for it to output. It'll just, it'll just display the text and I'll move on with what it's doing. And um, yeah, Josh, if you could go back to the presentation. Yep. All right, want me to go to the next slide?
Mm -hmm. All right, so the next thing that we're going to get into is method overloading. All right. So if you're coding the same thing over and over and over again, but with different data types for the actual, um, but with different data types for the actual um, uh, thing, like let's say you're using int for one thing, then you're using a double for another. Um, uh, it's best to actually method overload for this. So method overloading is just where the name of the method stays the same, but the parameter, the actual signature of the method, it's, um, it has a different signature, which is the parameters. And um, basically that means that either the, um, either the parameters inside of there are a different type or they're in a different order. And the, actually, the acronym to remember that by is NOT, which is name, order, type. And in order to properly overload a method, you have to have the same name. They have to be in a different order, or they have to be a different type. And actually, if you look at this, uh, if you look at this image on the right-hand side, what you can see is um, you can see uh, actual um, an actual example of method overloading. So there's my function, and that's just a void. So it'll just execute code, and that'll be done with it my function with an actual parameter of an int. And um, basically, if you type it my func if you type in my function, then you actually put in a number that's an integer. It's gonna say, okay, I need to run to my function that actually has my function that actually has an int in it. It's a float one, which is basically a double. Um, and then there's uh, my function with an int and a float, but then there's another one where they're in a different order, float and mint. And um, you can see that at the right, at the left-hand side, it's actually returning a float value. So that's also different. And so, um, yeah. And so if we go back to REPL, we'll be able to actually demonstrate this. Okay, I stopped sharing. Mm -hmm. What we can do is we can actually take this room area thing again, and then we can just um, we can edit it a little bit. So what we can do is we can do um, a public static, and then double again. Then um, what we can do is we can actually have the radius of the Oh, we forgot to put in a name. Room area. So if we remember back to what the actual things are, you have to have the same name, a different parameter type. So let's say that the radius is actually a double value this time. That's a different type. So if we put in double, then we, uh, we can name it radius. Put in our curly brackets, and then we can just do the same code over again. So uh, we have the um, code for our uh, radius now. And then all we need to do is we just need to return area again. And so now we can actually go back to here. And so what we've done is we've created something called a method overload. And so when we actually call our method, so let's go to where we're calling our method. Here. If we just split, so over here in room two radius, since room two radius is an integer, as it said over here, it actually, when it's actually running the method, it's gonna look, okay, which one do I need to run? It looks for the one with the parameter of an integer. It sees the integer one, and that actually runs the one for the integer. And so um, it gives that value. But if it's a double, so let's say we switch uh, room two radius to 10.5, then it's going to be like, okay, and we need to change this to a double, of course. It's going to be like, okay, when 
I'm actually running the code. It's gonna be, it's gonna say, all right, my parameter is a double. So let's look for the double value. Let's look for the double method. So there's public static double, and that sees the actual um, parameter here. And so it sees that's a double. The types match up and it runs this one rather than this one. And so, so, so to make it more clear, could you put a print statement inside each each method just to prove mm -hmm. it? Yeah. OK, so yeah. if it actually runs uh, the double one, we can actually say system dot out dot print ln. The uh, um, parameter is a double. Then uh, for here, for the int one, we could just do the parameter is an int. Then when you run it again, it should display that the parameter is a double. The parameter is a double. And then um, the reason why it's actually displaying the parameter is an int is because of uh, the room three radius one. We can just comment that out. Or just and print then, that out as well. Put that in print. Oh, you want me to print that one? Okay. Yeah. Sure. Just, 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 yeah. For the sake of completeness. All right. And then now they'll display in both. So this one overloads to a double. This one overloads to an int. And so yeah, that's basically what um, this is, what overloading is. And so yeah. So are there any questions on method return statements or method overloading? I'm going to go ahead and check the teams. Um, Doesn't look like anything in chat. Yeah, I don't see anything in chat. No I don't see anything. Chance. Yeah, no one is that anything. So everyone understands what a method is, how, how to declare a method, how to return data from a method, and how to overload a method. I think they're all asleep. Like last week? I mean, we, we haven't heard anything but crickets, and this is probably one of the most important things that we're going to teach is how to call a method, or some people call it a function. Um, you know, being able to call a subroutine like this is really, really important, and be able to pass data to it is a fundamental concept of Java. So if anybody's got any questions or issues or things are not clear, you should ask now because everything else these guys are going to teach you is going to build on this. So those that are sleeping, wake up. Is anybody alive? No. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Okay, does this make sense to you guys? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Because yeah. all of the first robot coding, everything that you're going to use to get that robot to move is going to be a method. All right. And being able to call that method with the appropriate parameters is, a, is the only way in the world you're going to get that robot to move. So understanding this is really, really, really important. Okay. Okay, guys. Sai, do you have a, a good test for them to or a quiz to see how they're doing? Yep. So we came up with a project for mean absolute deviation. So Josh, can you pull up the go to the second to last slide? Okay. Um, 
do we still want to do anything for um no i think we have to push that later okay. no worries so Fossi, would you like to introduce this project all right yeah sure so um i if you guys remember from if you guys remember like from i think like math six or math seven something uh, you learned mean absolute deviation. And if you haven't, well, this is a good practice for the future. Uh, so mean absolute deviation uh, it is basically where you can get, it's where you find out exactly how far, the average of how far each number is from the average. It's a tongue full, it's a mouthful, um, I don't know the saying, but like tongue twister, but yeah. So what you do is you get the average of the numbers, then you get the distance of how far each number is to, to that average, and then you get the average of all those numbers. So what your guys' challenge is, is to um, actually create a Java program where you have to get, where you have to calculate the mean absolute deviation of five numbers. And then the equation's up there, and you should be using methods in actually coding this. And um, yeah. Yeah, so I remember when I did this in like, I think it was a math eight or something, it was like really annoying. It's not hard because it's just addition and division and subtraction, but like it's the basic functions, but like you have to keep doing it over and over and it got really, really annoying. It's really so, time consuming. Yeah, really annoying and really time consuming. So now that you can, you're in code and you can use methods, it should make it a lot easier. And just to prove the power of code, if you can get it working with five five numbers, why not try six or seven or 10, right? Just to show you how functions or methods make everything easier. So are there any questions on the project or anything that we've taken, that we've covered so far? Do you guys find the challenges um, good to help you learn the code? Has anyone anybody, actually been doing the challenges? Yeah, has yeah. anybody done the challenges? Yes. Some of them. So would you like to share your code, challenge code? So we can look over it together. So I mean, does anyone want to share their code? Sure. All right, what's your name? Thanosh. Can you raise your hand? Yeah, one second. I'll go ahead and stop my share. Yeah. How do you raise your hand? Um, there should be a hand icon in the bottom bar in Teams. I think I can just give it, I, I'm able to see. Did, did you find him? Yeah. Okay, just make him a presenter then. Let's see. Um, okay, I'll click the three dots. And all I see is pin. I think only you can do that way. Oh, wait, no, they're already a presenter, actually. They're, yeah, they're already. Okay. All right, yeah, then you can present. Okay, present you should be your, able to share your screen. Open up your Rapal and share your screen. Which one should I show? Any one you want, whatever. Yeah, whatever. sales tax calculator is prime. If for some reason you were already able to do the mad one, sure, show that one too. Okay, I'll show the prime one. Yeah, that's my favorite one. It's saying that I only meeting organizers and presenters can share. Um, you're listed as a presenter. At least what I see is you're listed as a presenter. For some reason, he's going to be attendees part. So, okay, are there multiple tonishes? Uh, no. no. I was no. going to ask uh, if we have to find a mad or standard. Are you, are, is your name Tanish Polisetti? Yeah. Okay, okay, there was another Tanish. 
who was a presenter. All right, so I'll make you a presenter. All right, now you can try and present. Can you see it? Yep, we can see it. So I made this one for the prime numbers. So you put in a number over here and then it takes, so a prime number has only two factors. So here's a program to see how, how many factors it has. It runs through to see how many factors. If there's more than two factors, then it'll say that your number is not a prime number. If it has two, then it'll say your number is a prime number. And if it's either zero or one, then it'll say your number is not prime or composite. Awesome. That yeah, really so that's, that's actually a really well designed program. Um, although that, that does look excellent. You should run it for everybody. Yeah, run it. So my number is 97. Wait. Yeah, 97 is prime, I believe, right? Yeah, 97 yeah, it's prime. is prime. Now, if you set it to 99, you should get composite. So why don't you try that? Yeah. Yeah, my number's yep. not a prime. So, so, yeah, it looks like it works. So good job. Excellent so, yeah, job. That is yeah, excellent. You're... Yeah, th this is a job really well done. So you, your program is what I'd like to call like a multi-purpose program where you can actually, because you have a lot of attributes to your uh, your program, which is like the factor count, like it actually counts how many factors there are, or mainly just because of that one property, you're actually able to get a good summary of multiple things, not just like if it's prime or not prime, right? Uh, like the, pro the challenge that we presented were, was just to determine whether it's prime or not. It doesn't matter whether it's zero, one, or composite, but because you're able to also get a factor count, uh, not only can you determine whether it's prime or not, you can also tell the user, hey, this is how many factors there are to the number in case you wanted to know. Um, on shorthand though, like if you wanted to, like if you were given an, uh, like an exam, let's say in your like concept class where you had to create this prime number calculator, and if they just asked um, like to determine whether it's prime, or not, that means like uh, you would want to go down the route of instead of like counting how many factors there are, you just keep testing factors until you get to one that's actually a factor of that number, and then you just stop the program right there. So that would be like a single purpose program, which wouldn't really be the whole, the real deal, but like it would just be the um, it would just be like the the bare minimum yet the most efficient version of just getting the task at hand complete. So yours does still exemplify like a really good, well-rounded program. Yeah, However, I, for the I think you've exceeded requirements, so you've yeah. done very well. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yep. Good job. Thanks for sharing too. It's constructive for everybody. I'd like to encourage that behavior. Right. For everyone in the class. Yep. Thank so from you. next class onwards, we'd like to have, we'd like to try and get more people to share their code, and see how you guys are doing. Yeah, the whole idea is to help everybody with their code, not to critique it for crying out loud. So, yeah. you know, you shouldn't you shouldn't worry about putting your code up there and then let's let's see how it works. Everybody will learn from that. Yeah, and if you're ever stuck, you can always email us and we can try and help you. Okay. Guys, I hate to be a Debbie Downer because this looks like it was going very, very well, but I got to get you off to your next class, OK? Right. So right. thank you guys so, for yep, thank you all for attending. Um I would share my slide to show you our contact emails, but by now you should hopefully have them. Once again, <laughs> if you think of any questions later on, uh feel free to email any of the four of us and we'll be more than happy to uh give you out your response. As usual, we will be posting the notes after the lecture and we'll try our best to have them also uploaded to our YouTube channel if you wanted to highlight parts that you weren't able to see clearly live during the lesson. So refer to those if you need further guidance. But other than that, we'll close out the session for today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.